I have an important question to ask you before we get into anything related to Native Shark. Yeah. Okay, what's up? Which is Who's your favorite Disney character? Wait. That's such a <laughs> Whew. Wait. So, are okay, we talking right? Disney franchise? Yeah. Like the all Disney franchise? Are we going like I'm not going to give you any context yet i'm just gonna ask you who's your favorite well, if, we're, if we're talking about the entire disney current disney franchise and my current feelings my current favorite disney character is the mandalorian oh that's cheating okay I, that's fine i though. mean okay <laughs> you didn't give me enough parameters yeah the mandalorian okay no when i taught english in japan on my first day of work, my boss, who was this Japanese woman who was about like five, six years older than me. Yeah. She was like, who's your favorite Disney character? And I, was, I thought, I, what? what? The first, the first day. <laughs> like, this is one, this is one, one of the first, first things my boss ever said to me of in Japan. This is your first job in Japan? At my, first, my first job in Japan. Okay. Yeah, who's your favorite Disney character? And I'll, I responded saying, uh, I, I don't know. And then my coworker <laughs> was like, you should figure out the answer to that question pretty soon because you live in Japan now. Okay. The reason I thought of that is just because I'm drinking this milk tea and it has like a picture of Ariel from Little Mermaid. Uh, oh, I should bring it back. Let's focus. It makes sense now. Yeah. So what did you say? Was it important? I don't think I even gave an answer. I don't remember. And I still don't really know who my favorite Disney character would be. Have you, have you been asked that since no see but you do if you go to like karaoke with friends you're going to be more popular if you sing a song from like a disney movie or something that's good to know all right i'm i'm yeah. say hey josh hey i'm the star hey artness cell talks How's oh it going? yeah oh, hey, I I forgot I was chat. <laughs> <laughs> this is nico's first time <laughs> um live streaming anything um so yeah we've got chat open we're gonna have a bit of just a podcast style discussion and then we're gonna have a specific sort of AMA session f with you in the chat towards the end. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. First episode, we're just gonna see what happens. Um, let's see. Best Disney character. Hmm, yes, difficult question. Is that a question you get a lot as a foreigner in Japan? No. Nah, I've actually never been I don't asked know. I got, that. I got, I got, yeah, I got asked it immediately at my first job and then never again but people... but then again like i had friends and you ask them like what's their what's your favorite movie and they'll say things like little mermaid and that's in the u.s you don't really hear like a 25 year old person saying something like that usually when you ask them what's your favorite movie um i've like never i've never had this experience and I'm, it's well i don't know I have had it many, That's many so times. That's so interesting. I mean, I've I've asked someone what their favorite movie is before, but I haven't had like, you know, I've gotten responses like Kimi no Nawa or Thinky no Ko. Um, maybe it's just the group that you roll with. Maybe. Huh. I try not to. I try not to ask people what's your favorite X Y Z. Such a difficult question to answer for me. I kind of agree. That's uh. I mean, it's a generic question. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a conversation piece. Is all it yeah. is. Yeah, but it's also because we think a lot about what questions does a student want to learn, so that they can use them in language exchanges or talking to a teacher. Right. And we actually intentionally avoid asking or teaching these questions. Like, I mean, we do teach them. Like, we have obviously, like, this is how you say, "What is your favorite?" Whatever, but we don't offer it up as recommended questions to learn for a language exchange or a lesson because at least half the time the answer is going to be <laughs> i don't know, know. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite book or something oh looks like they can hear me from your mic slightly i can barely hear nico from caleb's mic really um that sounds like I'd have to change my headphones. That sounds like so much effort. Oof. Um, or just turn down the volume of your headphones. Can you do that? Wait, your no. brain is huge. Yeah, I can do that. 
Uh, I don't know if that's going to make overall stream quieter or not. We'll find out. Um, mm. Okay. I can maybe push my mic a little bit further away and see if that changes it. Josh says that he goes to Japan just to go to Tokyo Disney Sea. <laughs> I've been there one time. I've never been there. My my two friends who used to be my students back in the day bought well, they took me to Disney Sea for my birthday as a surprise. Okay. Do you that say used fun. to be your friends? Students, my students. Oh, they became oh my okay, okay, okay. I got confused there for a second. I thought you said these two people used to be my friends, and I was like, wait. Used to be what happened? Is it juicy? It was, yeah, it was fun. Except for they wanted to wait in line for roughly an hour to take a picture with Mickey, which I thought was kind of not the best use of our time at Disney Sea. But I didn't say anything, so we did do that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you um been to Disneyland or Disney World in the U.S.? Yeah, I've been to Disneyland tons of times yeah, okay. I'm from southern that's what california, i thought so. i was gonna say for someone who's coming from southern california maybe picture with mickey isn't top of the list of things of yeah things you want to so do. maybe that's part of it yeah yeah that's fair so you you learn a lot of interesting things talking to students in japan like when you teach english because you figure i used to teach about 40 lessons per week with one to four students um, so I did that for almost two years. So you end up meeting hundreds, maybe over a thousand students over the course of that time. And you start to notice these patterns when you ask questions or talk about certain topics with students. And one of them is that if you bring up Disney C, a large percentage of the students would mention that if you go to Disney C, you can buy beer and a turkey leg <laughs> and eat turkey legs. I have heard that um, before. I don't actually know if they do that anymore, yeah. but I know they did do that. I've heard it. I wanted to open like a turkey leg standing bar in Tokyo because of the fact that I heard so many students get so excited about eating a huge yeah. turkey leg at DVC that I thought this oh, business would make tons of money. You know, I got to say that your business ideas often are a little bit goofy. Yeah, but it's it's like it's candy for Insta buy, which is like posting stuff on Instagram. So they say yeah. Insta buy. Um, you know, and the girls will like it because turkey legs are big, and so it'll make your face look small. <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, yeah. but it's also that, that for example, um, for like boba tea, the larger yeah. or sizes yeah. are getting more popular because it makes your face look smaller if you hold it. Yeah, up I your mean, face. it's just about the it's all about the gram, dude. It's all that matters. Yeah, I never thought about face size being a thing until I came to Japan and. So many people mentioned it, like, oh, her her face is so small. She's so cute. <laughs> Call it <the> chair. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hmm. Just the things right. you learn. Well, we had a couple things we wanted to just talk, <laughs> talk, <laughs> talk, <laughs> talk to talk to each other about Disney besides stuff. Disney. Um so Yeah, we should do the stuff that we're supposed to do. We haven't actually had a meeting with just the two of us for over a week now which is really rare, rare for the two of us that is really rare usually we meet multiple times just the two of us per week but yeah for several hours each time yeah we've not been doing that as much the past week and a half or so i don't i don't really know why but it just happened that way i there are a lot of reasons one of them is that i'm working so much to get new collaborators to help with content production as we test out our new production workflows so that we get more content being created. Hmm. And in the past, when we've hired freelancers and things, um, I think sometimes I didn't give it the attention it deserved because hmm. I find, you know, I post a job, you get a lot of applications from people and my experience when you do that is that their resume doesn't really matter when it comes to making this content that we want for Native Shark. For example, if a, an applicant says they have experience teaching Japanese, it's usually a red flag. It's not a good thing because yeah. they end up 
write, writing are weird things, and I certainly don't don't want them to be a voice actor because they'll speak too slowly. Right. Um, but because of that, sometimes the less experienced applicants are more valuable. Uh, and as a result, over the years, I just started posting a job and I just hire like everybody and then let them weed themselves out to see who's great. Mm. But I'm also trying to not hire them too quickly this time and get to know the person a little bit better before we hire them. Cause we're talking about hiring lots of people to, con to contribute to these new workflows. Right. Um, because we want the content to be created very quickly and we've divided it into lots of small jobs um, so that that's possible. And it also will increase the amount of checks and balances so that there's less errors in the content. Basically just fix all the things that happened while we were making phase one and like the reason it took us too long to get that content out and the reason it's not getting published on a regular basis now. So right. I've been doing that kind of stuff all day, every day. And I think that's part of the reason we haven't been meeting is that I've mm. been writing all these workflow instructions. I've been finding and talking to a number of freelancers about the jobs that they will potentially be doing for us. And some of them have already started doing. That makes sense. It yeah. does make sense. Um, I think especially it's important, like you said, um, that we, you know, figure out the content uh, workflow this time, this way so that we actually can scale in speed for content production. Um, as many of our students would be aware, um, you know, we haven't posted. I just wrote about this in the uh, update letter that I published yesterday, but we haven't posted new content for like six weeks. Uh, that's the reason, because if we did it the way that we made phase one content, we would never finish <laughs> all four phases in a timely manner. We wouldn't be able to scale to new languages, which is another thing that I talked about in our update letter. So what Nico has been working on the past couple of weeks um, essentially solves that problem. And it also solves the problem of if you're teaching more languages, isn't that slowing down? And not really because it actually, once we figure out the process, it's horizontally scalable, uh, which is the main goal. We're working on um, finding a process and then making it scale horizontally so we can do everything in parallel, essentially. So as much mm -hmm. content as we want can be done in parallel. So the platform itself doesn't quite support that. So we do have to um, build in that part of the, of the platform, but I would almost consider that to be easy compared to getting the workflow proper and, and, and working. Cause like, I know how to solve the, yeah. I know how to make the plot, like code the platform yeah. to make it do what it needs to do. Finding the right people and building the right, uh, workflow. Like, you know, that's, that's taking, taking time, you know, cause it takes care. We have a really high quality standard, things like that. Got to build in the checks and balances, everything of that nature. Yeah, I'm very hesitant to say so, but it seems like these new workflows are effective. And I'm seeing this content start to get created, and it's very exciting for me. Like, I mean, I'm glad to hear that. I don't want to say <laughs> I don't want to say too much about how it's done, right. Not um, yet. because I'll just talk forever. But I will say that, for example, for the the new phase two units that are coming up next, I was looking at the content yesterday afternoon about what's coming up next. And in the past, I would have been the one deciding how, what, what are we teaching? How, what are the sentences? And then I'm going and asking these uh, native speakers to help me finalize what I was thinking. And it's, that's kind of been flipped on its head with the new way we're doing things. And it's just, it's turning out very well. And um, you know, what, you know what that sounds like Nico? What? It sounds like we, you might be uh, growing a, a business, sir. <laughs> right yeah hey. which is the other thing because you know if ray and i are the only ones who can create a unit then yeah and the fastest pace to study japanese is the two-year pace that's two units a day which means that over the course of a week it's 14 which means that if we're not working weekends we have to publish at least three units per day and <laughs> just to be safe that means we should probably do four and yeah, it's, it's not sustainable. 
it's very it's very clear <laughs> it's very clear that what you're what you're saying is is that it isn't sustainable of course it's not it's too much content for two people to make before. yeah and even e even if a single unit only has maybe 12 to 15 sentences that you need to learn um, we actually create over 30 sentences yeah. to make that unit because there are things like kanji example sentences there are dialogues there are all kinds of things that go into it um so yeah it's impossible for two people to do that or i mean even three which we had because we had Thai working on it for a while there also right um it's, it's very unlikely that we would do that at the speed we would need to unless i didn't do any other work which means that we're never going to do all this other stuff that we need to do yeah so it's exciting that it seems to be working right it makes a lot of sense you um you went pretty deep into like what almost felt like a justification as to why you're doing it. I'm like, no, it makes sense. Uh, I think maybe it's part of well, I mean, I you, you already know why, but I mean, yeah. people watching don't necessarily know why. For sure. That's true. Of course. Well, that said, like, you know, we've been working together for f five, five and a half years now. And since the beginning, it's always been, I don't know. Uh, a struggle maybe is the right word to f get to a place where um, you're happy with not producing all the content yourself it's been a journey to yeah. get to this point oh <laughs> uh, yeah it's always been a goal yeah and over the past five years I've always been thinking about like that's like as you know that's been one of my biggest goals is how to get to a system where we can get it so that Nico is not creating all of the content because that is not a sustainable system. Yeah. And, and Ray also. And Ray, yeah, yeah, of course. The two of you not making the content. So, yeah, that's been a huge motivation. And, like, why we decided to go down the path of building our own content management <laughs> tools and stuff like that. Yeah. Because our systems were too... Um, I want to say unique, but I don't know if that's the right word, but that's why, you know, it, it mattered. Like our content is just different. It's not like we're not writing a textbook, you know, so it has different parameters, um, you know. I don't know where we were going with that. Oh, that we haven't met in a while. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, that's possible why. for us not to go on a tangent. Oh, anyway, uh, we had a couple other, oh, other couple other things that we wanted to just try to talk about for a bit. Um, a couple notes here, a few things. Yeah, and we can talk about stuff related directly to the platform later and do the AMA toward the end. Yeah, um, let's talk about things that we'll... aren't that for a second then. And then we'll go talk yeah. about education and the platform and have an AMA session with chat. Sound good? Yeah. All right, you said before though, so I don't know so... what you were gonna say. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> so every day I wake up at four, usually four thirty, uh, and I start working immediately. I just crawl out of bed and walk to the computer and start working. Um, then I work till eight or eight thirty, and after that I go to the gym, and then I work some more, and. So I kind of end my day relatively early, usually like 2 p.m. Mm. now with my new schedule. Yeah. So I work like 8 to 10 hours, 10 hours total, but maybe 9 or so if you throw in the gym. Um, when I'm not working, I'm listening to lots and lots of podcasts. Mm. And in downtime, I also read a lot of books on the Kindle app on my phone. And normally, like while I'm doing these, I'll be texting Caleb, tons of thoughts about the content I'm interacting with. Right. Like, hey, I just, I read this in this book. Like, what do you think? Or I, you know, I listen to this podcast. What do you think? Or we talk about it in one of our meetings that we have all the time. But since we haven't been having those, that's the other part of we haven't met in a long time. What have we missed? And I have all these things I want to talk about that I've read or listened to yeah. that are relative to our business that I haven't talked to you about. So right. I kind of wanted to discuss. Some so, of so now we're going to talk about it on a podcast instead basically yeah just in front of a bunch of people just, just in front of a couple people that's that's all good all right so well what's one been, thing what's is been on been your reading, mind 
Yeah, I've been reading this book called Brand Gap, which is a relatively famous book about branding. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit older. And in it, it has these three questions that you should ask if you're a business. Number one is who are you? Number two is what do you do? And number three is why does it matter? And you should have an unambiguous, ideally one sentence answer to each of those questions. And so of course, while I'm reading this book, I thought, well, what are the answers for Native Shark? Right. And for this, who are you question, I was thinking that we often refer to ourselves as an education technology company. Um, mm. yep. And I'm wondering if that's ac accurate because it doesn't imply that we actually teach things. It implies that we build the software. That's a good point. Th through which things are taught. In, in a way, it seems more like we're a digital learning institution or something. If we think about the trajectory that we're on. Mm. So I'm just wondering, who is Native Shark really? Because maybe we're not a technology company. Well, it depends on, I guess, what you think of as a technology company. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we make does, we make but... software. That is true, for the purpose of education. That is also true. Um, but we also teach content or teach material. So maybe we're an. Hmm. I like the word education though yeah. you know I do yeah and I like the nice word technology word. it sounds nice yeah but I but I see what you're saying about uh being a digital learning institution which which is interesting. yeah see I'm just trying to say that he thinks that we're probably not a technology company I'm kind of leaning toward that as well I don't know <laughs> I feel like he says if you not sell the technology, we do sell the technology that we make on a subscription. It's a service. Well, sort of, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, it is software as a service. I would so, I would say tech a, company doesn't yeah. have to make tech for the sake of tech. That's what I'm getting at. So we're not making it for the sake of tech. We're making tech, but for education. Hmm. I see what you're saying. I like it. I'll think, I'll yeah. think about that. But I mean, you think about our customer mm. who is a person who thinks that learning a language will change their life in some way. Yeah. And just if I'm talking to that person, does it matter that we're a software as a service company or does it matter that we're going to teach them what they want to learn? Mm. Yeah, I definitely think the latter is what matters more. For sure. So I was thinking about that. Yeah, now I'm going to think about it too. <laughs> and I I think we should keep thinking about that. Yeah, I think it matters more than, more than not, honestly. Because framing, framing is important. Mental framing, right? How we think about ourselves, how we portray ourselves. Those things matter. Yeah. Hmm. And anyway, we should have really clear answers to those questions. I don't think we'll, Otherwise, I don't think we'll come up with think... them today. No, <laughs> but we should keep thinking about them because I think if we don't have very clear answers to those questions and we do grow very quickly, we might grow into the wrong type of company. Mm. So certainly something to think about. Mm. The other stuff I've been <laughs> reading um, and listening to is a lot of Seth Godin stuff. I don't know if anyone knows who Seth Godin is, but he's a writer of many, many, many but, business and marketing yes. books. Um, Isn't it like 400 or something? Books? I don't. I mean, he has like 19 or 20 no, bestsellers, yeah. something like no, that. No, no, it's not books. He's a podcast too, right? I mean, With a lot of episodes. It's a podcast with like a couple hundred, right. but he has a, one of the first blogs with thousands and thousands of posts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I do know who he is. I just couldn't, couldn't remember yeah. how big his uh, work was. How much? Uh, and he used to also have startup companies, like a number of mm. them that he sold for 
lots of money. And there's a little bit that he had about, I was reading his book, Lynchpin, which is also kind of older and talks about having employees that are not cogs in a machine, but that are linchpins. And I don't really feel like talking about that right now. So instead we can talk about, um, he mentions this thing about perfectionism and quality and determining what's good enough. Mm. And a lot of times when we say something is high quality, we, we mean that it is good, close to perfect, very good. But he argues that quality means built to spec and which is, it is what it's supposed to be. So a Toyota is higher quality than a Rolls Royce because it is built closer to spec than a Rolls Royce because a Rolls Royce is handmade, mm. right? So, it's not as luxurious, but it's higher quality. It's a, um, it's a very Seth Godin thing to do. <laughs> he yeah. loves to take words well, and then be like, no, I think about them like this. I, you know, I like it. Um, anyway... And I think perfectionism is something that both you and I struggle with because even, yeah, like for the content, like it goes back to this thing of they and I are making, we're making the content by ourselves for the last several years, five, six, seven years. And we have tried many times to hire other people to make content. And the problem is that usually Ray and myself get so frustrated with what we yeah. think is flawed content that we end up just firing the writers and, and writing it yourself. doing it ourselves. Yeah. And But then even that content doesn't end up being perfect because we're, our team is too small and we end up needing to make the content more quickly than it's possible for two people. Yes. So... I end up having to publish content anyway that is imperfect. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of that go is the same for you when it comes to the design mm. of Native Shark. For sure. I, I always do want it to be to be perfect and then the team isn't large enough. So it's it's just myself and my Chie. And then we're building something in a certain way. And then I, we can't make it quite the way we want it to. So then it has to come out anyway. So why did I not just try to build it less perfect the first time? Yeah, it's a struggle. Yeah. And I think we, to get around this, it may help for us to have clearer constraints about what we're going to do at each step that we're doing it. Yeah. Um, I want to say we've been moving in that direction for about yeah. since October, actually, you know, since we hit October, we've really been, the both of us have really been focusing in on, all right, what are the really clear constraints? What can we do with exactly what we have now so that we can get to somewhere else later? And also how can we release sooner? instead of holding things yeah. for too long, essentially. Like, here's a good example. We pushed the most recent update um, at the end of October, even though it didn't have the, the new learning experience finished, right? Because yeah. the performance was there, the new flashcard system was there, and the new pricing was there. And those things were all really important, but we had been holding some of that for about you know, almost three weeks. Like, that's too long. For a long, number of reasons, mm -hmm. I don't want to get exactly why, but it's just too long to hold um, a, um, an update. And we know that we didn't finish the the um, the full learning experience. Right now, it just says "got it" when you when you see it the first time. Um, so that's how it got it got published. It doesn't have the the full new learning experience. Um, but I think it was worth it. It was better. It was it's it's better platform now than it was before the update even though it doesn't have the full experience and that's i think what's important for us to get better at understanding and realizing is you know it doesn't have to be exactly what we think it's going to be and even even this new the even the uh new learning experience that we're going to come out with in a couple of weeks isn't the full version of what i want it to be <laughs> you know yeah. the design isn't going to be perfect this does not going to have all of the um interconnectivity that i want it to have 
but it's going to be better than than what it was and better than what it is now um so yeah definitely that is yep. something that we should keep working on you know figuring out that balance between uh perfection yeah. and quality and then, i guess yeah perfection quality or just determining what is good enough at which stage and yeah right minimum viable everything. i noticed i noticed these comments um from josh saying that's the great thing about software dev you can deliver at least some value and keep iterating but does that work with content? And I think, no, it does not. Yeah, that's not so much. <laughs> um, because not only do we have the problem mentioned um, by Lukat, I don't know how to say your name, sorry, uh, which is that some people have already consumed the earlier content. That is a slight problem. Um, the other problem is that we have iterative content, so it builds on, it, on itself. Yeah. So you can't just go back and change a unit in phase one without considering the implications for not only the students who have studied that unit, but how it affects the units that come after it and does it use all the content that comes from before it. So this is part of the problem that we faced when we were working out these new workflows for creating content. And how do you have greater um, QA standards and produce the content faster mm. and not only do it from english to japanese but for 12 different language directions <laughs> so those are the constraints right and we don't have a ton of money either so we can't go hire 50 employees which is what we used to think we would have to do a year ago yeah. today we were talking and we were like there's so much it's gonna take what's gonna what's gonna happen when we're gonna skip we're gonna have to hire dozens hundreds of content creators yeah um so working in those constraints, we did actually figure out a way that it's possible to do that. And it involves having extreme constraints and QA controls on the sentence level, the material level. Right. Um, I'm guessing most people don't know the, the lingo we use for different types of content, but you have a unit and then a unit is made up of studyables, which would be a lesson or a group of vocab or a group of kanji or a dialogue. Those are called studyables. And then the lower level from that is a material. So that'd be like an example sentence. So on the material level, we need to have really, 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 really strict quality controls. And we have to have really, really strict quality controls in determining what materials are in which studyables are in which units. Mm -hmm. So that it is very difficult for us to go and change a unit or to go change a material. Right. It's not difficult for us to go and change the way we explained it. So hmm. we took, we're taking that all into account right. while we do this, these new workflows. And additionally, because we're putting more of the emphasis on this material production quality, it's actually not hard for us to expand from one target language into multiple, to teach one target language yeah. from multiple source languages. Yes. I saw some people making some, basically just wondering out loud in Discord, how is that going to work? How are you going to do 12 different language directions? Yeah. Um, and we, we have thought about this a lot. And actually giving ourselves that problem is what Got us to this led point. to us developing a workflow that works better, even just from English to Japanese. Right. Even if we didn't want to have all these new language directions, I would want to use the new workflows that we're, we've just built to make the Japanese content from English yeah. that we're trying to it do was, right now. It was this um, switch that happened, I think in September. I don't know exactly what triggered it, but we were having a meeting in my house. We were just having a conversation. And then we realized, I think it came from, actually, I think I know what triggered it. It was the architecture meeting that I had had with um, Jacob and Manuel the previous week where we had, ar where would, we had thought together, okay, what are we... You know, we, we got Native Shark 1.0 functioning. You know, it works. We're get, we, you know, we're selling it now. What is Native Shark 2.0? What is the better version of this going to look like? How are we going to architect? Because when we first built Native Shark 1.0, you know, we made lots of mistakes, lots of problems. I, um, so we wanted to think going forward, what are we going to do? So we had an architecture sprint, right, where we spent a week architecting uh, the future. 
and I, that i think when we went through that process and figured out like oh how um how much better we can make our, our development cycles all of that um what we can do with our technology that we weren't doing um you know especially with the transition to going serverless you know being on the cloud entirely um that conversation i think we were talking about that and that's what triggered it and that's when we realized wait we need to think about the material level itself the the most like that's the most important part get that the highest quality and then from there because like you said you can change the way that you explain something easily as much as you want but that only works in the system only ma maintains stability if the uh contextually iterative immersion content the c content as we call it is is good is, is quality and is arranged in an order uh that makes sense because you you only have so many tickets of being able to change that you know like the order in which things are done like you can do it maybe once but after that it's like yeah like what they were saying in chat um you get to this problem of people will have learned or not learned something so it gets messy so that's why that's such an important thing to get right uh going forward but that realization is what made all this possible and why it's now we're this new approach is like oh wait this is actually doable and that's that's why we made the announcement on where we're going because we're we have you know the, the capacity to do so now and we didn't previously because and then we're, here's an interesting thing right um you know talking about um where we were earlier with like mental frameworks what what changed in this distinct was just a distinction of terms essentially and a distinction a, a different way of thinking nothing physically changed um other than the way that we were thinking about it which led to a better solution yeah i think i've i noticed caridia caridias caridias i don't know how to say your name sorry <laughs> uh said that you would have to pre-plan the exact place of each unit though and yes kind of sort of right now we have we have to do that once we have our new cmp built content management platform we, that's what cmp stands for yeah sorry our content management it's the platform on which we create the content right now we use a wide variety of tools um we're all over the place because we have to mesh together various tools out in the world so that we can do what we need to do which is very unique once we have the cmp done we will know each piece of new information that a student has learned at a certain point. Because of that, we could change earlier units in an, in an earlier phase that a student has learned, but the CMP would know what is new that a student past this point is now gonna need to learn. What has the student already learned? And because of that, it is also theoretically possible that once we have the full CMP built, we could go back and change yep. phase one in a certain way and it wouldn't really matter to the student because the system would warn them, oh, hey, here's some new content that got added earlier. You could study it if you, you want. We have to figure out how we want to present yeah. that to students, obviously. Um, but it should be totally possible. 100% uh, possible. we're designing with that in mind. And the other reason is because everyone really wants a level check system and a level placement system. And more than everyone this doesn't work unless that works they, like they're they're one in the same well, i want to say a bit on that is i would say just that everyone wants one that's why we're doing it we've always intended on having one um oh we yeah. just haven't had I mean, the, we just haven't had the you know people have asked like why not just do x why not just do y and this comes back to that quality versus per perfection conversation and what i'm describing is the is mm -hmm. the near perfect way to do it so we're we're likely going to have a a earlier solution for level check that is not closer to perfect it's just one that works but one of the main reasons why we we haven't done it and didn't do it initially um was one because there wasn't phase two content to test you into uh and two uh we didn't have the, the technology put together yet to do it in a way that i think is even worth doing i i think it's better to have not done it than to have done it poorly which is what most of the internet most tools in existence do most tests um, but the way that we're working, like building a level check system, um, it, essentially it, it will know what you know and be able to dynamically place you on the knowledge tree, essentially, quite accurately. 
uh, because of the way that the, the, con the, the system itself is aware of the content and the system is aware of what content the student knows. Mm -hmm. So the interplay between these two things um, allows both updating old content without the student not knowing something and also um, placing them very ac accurately on the knowledge tree. Um, for those people who are interested yeah. in the technology, technological aspect, it's essentially building a knowledge graph um, for the student. Every individual student essentially has a knowledge graph. That's, that's how it works. Yeah. There's also this issue of we get students come in and they'll say, I'm intermediate level, I'm whatever level. So I want to skip all yeah. of phase one or something. Um, and then, and maybe, then Native Shark isn't, isn't structured normally, oh. so then you have actually have no idea, and then we have this whole problem that we have. Yes. Yes, and going forward, it's going to be, that will be even, even more, more so. I don't want to say problematic, because it's not because of the way we're doing it, but it, on the surface seems problematic because the way we're doing unit planning now is that every unit should contain information that you would not know unless you had grown up in Japan yeah. or lived there for a very long time. At some point, unit one of phase one should have at least two of those pieces of knowledge, right? So, oh, I already know everything in unit one, but maybe you don't know this other little thing. Um, so how do you level check for that? And that's another thing that CMP is going to have to account for. And we actually have some ideas about how it could work. Actually, I think we know exactly how it'll work, but I'm not going to go too much into that. Yeah. But you have like the example of, I think, unit nine or something. We have the, the lesson on how to say hello. And of course, we teach konnichiwa because it's a useful word to know. Um, Interestingly, we're one of the only people who don't teach it in the first lesson. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, one of the many reasons we don't teach it in the first lesson is because, as you see, if you read that lesson, is that you don't really say it to friends and family. You don't, I don't walk up to like Ray or her mom and be like, Konnichiwa. It's weird. I do say it to people who live in my building that I don't even know their name right. and they say it to me. Yep. Um, so, yeah, you might already know the word Konnichiwa. So that's this level. Yeah. And then there's the knowledge of knowing that you don't only really say it to friends and family. Then there's the knowledge of what do you say to friends and family. And then it gets more interesting because now it depends on the context. It depends on not only who is the person and who are you, but what has been happening. Like, are you meeting up with a friend after work? Because then you just say, well, it's got it. Like, yeah. it's hey, but it's, you know, you just finished work, you're tired sort of thing it doesn't actually mean that um <laughs> yeah it doesn't doesn't really mean that but so. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter it, do, it, it does in that context which is the thing with japanese is it's a highly contextual yeah. language and that throws off a lot of people coming from non-highly contextual languages like english especially english speakers we, we often just want to know and also language learners but especially english language learners um maybe western language learners western western language yeah, learners towards Japanese in general. I'm not sure. I don't know if I can make a generalization. But in general, we really want to know what something means, quote unquote, in Japanese. Um, and that's a whole thing in and of itself. <laughs> what does that something really mean? Uh, it really depends. It really does. Like people say it all the time. They're like, oh, it depends. And sometimes I think people maybe get frustrated with that answer. But it's true. It actually just depends. Um, and But that's why we... Um, are building our content later that we are to help you understand that and get used to that from the get-go that it really does depend that's okay you don't even worry about it because it makes sense to you when the time comes you get used to it yeah it's okay i, I see amnistar asked you know what is the methodology you use for determining the path of which words grammar rules etc you introduce and when hmm. uh there's a lot of things that we do for that um we do check what other people do of course because well, you, you, you should know to. what other educators yeah. are doing. Yeah. So we are aware of the order in which they teach grammar concepts in other language learning materials or for the JLPT or something. Additionally, we scour lots and lots and lots of content. And then we have native speakers give it what we internally refer to as an obscurity rating. So 
you have you know, an idiom, for example, and then the native speaker rates it on how obscure it is. And the meaning of obscurity here is how often do you encounter it? Do you encounter it every day, multiple times a day, or do you encounter it only if you have a job in the specific profession or if you're a history major or something? Uh, so that's one way we do it. Additionally- And then on one note on that, we you take a, yeah. a relatively large sample size and you kind of average out the way that the ratings that you get and that's kind of how you can figure out what the obscurity of something is yeah the other thing we do is you've probably noticed this if you study with andrew shark is that we discovered almost every single conjugation pattern possible in phase one um aside from the fact that every conjugation pattern almost is very useful i mean you don't use like passive causative that often um you actually can use it. I hate it sometimes, but the reason that we teach all of those in phase one is because it is relatively low amounts of time is requ are required to learn patterns, but they the payoff from doing so is rather high right. because if you're not aware of how a verb may be conjugated and you're watching a show or listening to someone talk, they might use words that you already know and you don't realize it because you don't know the conjugation that they're using. Definitely. Um, this is a problem that I had when I was a student. And part of the problem is that, you know, they don't teach you, for example, um, causative or passive forms until what they call intermediate uh, Japanese. Yeah, in the terms of textbooks, it's the it's yeah. past Genki 1, past Genki 2. It's in the... To Tobira, whatever that's called. I can't remember right now. It's in that one. I believe they don't teach passive and I don't, I I don't think did. so. Um, Maybe. It's been so long. Yeah, I'm not sure if they teach all the uses of it. Yeah, um, even even like, still, typically that's like a year or more into someone's studies. Probably two years in most cases at that pace. Yeah. Whereas if you're doing one unit a day, I think you would learn those Five. after like four, four, months. four months. Four months. Yeah, four months. So it's probably around unit one to one year or something. Um, because it's not that much new information to learn and the payoff is really high. So that's another thing that we right. do. What is, um, to summarize that, we basically look at what are things that are like low effort, but really high reward, regardless of where they're normally taught, according to other educators, we'll look at that and say, okay, if you learn this concept, the payoff is really high. You can do a lot more functionally with it. So let's bring that down. Let's bring that close to the beginning and figure out what we need to teach before that to make it so they can understand it when you get to it. Uh, and then it's like, look at what's been unlocked to you significantly more rather than arbitrarily feeling, seemingly arbitrarily waiting to hold this out, um, this piece of knowledge that'll like unlock a lot uh, for you. So that's, um, you know, another methodology consideration. Yeah. And then we also do consult frequency lists, right. but with great reservation. With a grain of salt. <laughs> they, <laughs> they tend to be really bad. Frequency they're, lists, they're man. Really, oh. They're ex extremely oh, misleading. They're painful. The um, amount of times that we hear people talking about frequency lists in our community, and I just want to be like, I know why you feel like it's appealing. I understand. I've been there. But they're so... I don't know. It's like a muse, you know, <laughs> it's like a, uh -huh. it, it, it's like a, not a muse, a siren. It's like a siren. There you go. That's my analogy for what frequency. It's, listens are. it's like the, 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 uh, the wailing sound that sounds nice or whatever. It's like, it, but then it's actually a monster. It leads you in. It's a trap basically. Oh, oh, a siren. A siren. I, I thought you said sire, siren, no. sire, siren, siren, siren. Yes. <laughs> what exactly do you think is bad about frequency lists? Oh, okay. I have a great okay. example of this. Um, it's kanji by frequency. That's my favorite. That's my um, favorite example of why the yikes. <laughs> <laughs> the kanji for political party, like click faction party, yeah. right? It's, according to the dictionary I'm looking at right now, it's 39 of the most used kanji in newspapers. So number 39, that's really high. It's one of the highest numbers. Why is it so high? Well, it's because they use newspapers to determine what are the kanji frequency. They use publications and the newspaper articles have lots of stuff about political parties in them. In 
the life of an average person who's not reading the newspaper. So a student, because you're not going to be able to read the newspaper until you're like phase three, phase four level. Um, phase three, most likely. Yeah. Well, I mean, depending you'll on be able the, to yeah. read, it's, it, I, I know what you're it's saying. It's pretty painful, especially the headlines are pretty painful until you're like phase four level because they abbreviate so many things. Um, and it's a pretty easy kanji to learn. It's not very complex looking. But it's not the 39th most important kanji to learn if you're a, a student of Japanese. And the same thing happens with words, obviously. And then the, uh, additionally, there's highly frequent kanji that are just used in names a lot, people's names. So, yeah, frequency yeah. lists are fun. Before we get into some of these questions. But we do, we do check them. We do look at the frequency lists and we go through them. Yeah. And we we think about, is this actually highly frequent material that we should teach earlier rather than later? But before we get too far into, there's some good questions being asked, but before we get into yeah. some of these. Um, You're tempting me. Yeah, I know, I'm, we're getting tempted, but what, what other <laughs> kinds of things about education, since that's like the segment of our discussion that we're quite into now. You know, in the future, we'll have the education. In the future, we'll have the other segment of our conversation somehow last longer, but I feel like we're always going to be Pull yeah, into, well, it's wanting to talk about education and stuff, um, but that's fine. That's you know, cool. It's all good. Yeah. Um, you know, by episode uh, two hundred and seventy-two, we'll be really good at this. So. Um, yeah. Well, let's keep talking about kanji because. Yeah, let's keep talking about kanji for sure. <laughs> because our students and. Oh, so, so I know if, if um, for the Twitch viewers, if you do ask questions in chat right right now, um, we'll in a bit we'll scroll back up and and read through them and and discuss what you guys ask. So we see the questions, but we might not respond right now. Just a heads up. I see. I was just this morning. Okay, wait. No, first question. Messages. First question. Okay. okay. Go ahead. I don't know if I, if I should ask you this or you should ask me this, but um oh, why ahead. does why does learning kanji learning air quotes kanji not matter okay yeah so the main reason to learn kanji in isolation like we have mnemonics and you this kanji means this thing the, the main reason to do that is to stop worrying whether or not you know the kanji yes it is helpful to know kanji so that you can understand words that contain them but you could skip learning kanji completely and probably be fine. So we're presented with this interesting problem where pretty much every student who studies Japanese is very, 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 very concerned about how am I gonna learn kanji? And so say they are studying with native shark and yeah, we teach kanji, we do have mnemonics for them because it's comforting to know, like I know that kanji, I, I, I know that what it means, so I can understand this word that it appears in. You have a student who's studying with Native Shark, who, which does teach kanji, and then they finish their studies for the day, and they have extra time, and they want to study more. And then they go to study more kanji, whether it be in a different resource or with a book or with a, an app or whatever. And I, I do not think it's a useful usage of your time as a student to go do right. that because for, I'm, a, I'm the greatest example of this because I was obsessed with kanji uh, okay, as a student. Side and... note, you did write the HJS, <laughs> which was kind of almost entire. You wrote that like one of the most read articles on the internet about learning kanji for like eight years but, straight. So that is who you're coming from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there's this difference between what was written there and what people read it as. So if you read the whole article, the whole lesson on how to learn kanji on HJS, or in HGS, on the Homo Shark, I do say the main reason to learn kanji like this is so that you stop worrying about them. Yeah. Because it doesn't really matter. And I, feel I am the great example of this because I did do kanji by mnemonics and I learned them in isolation. And then I also learned them with example words for each onyomi kunyomi, for each kanji. And then... I learned Japanese and I forgot the meanings of all the kanji, mostly in isolation. And this really interesting thing happened when we're doing phase one content. 
So we decided we want to make it accessible for a student to see the onyomi kunyomi examples for kanji if they want to. So before it was the show more, show less in your flashcards. Now there's a little eye you can click to see an example sentence with a word that contains that kanji for onyomi kunyomi. Creating those lists so the students can see them. I saw all these words that I learned like five, six years prior because I was studying kanji and I was so worried that I didn't know onyomi kunyomi for both of them. Right. So I actually learned a word for each one. And then a lot of those words I never encountered ever again until we made the list to have them <laughs> in the database of Native Sharp. Yeah. It's like, oh, I remember that word. It was in my flashcards years ago. So why is a student who is phase one level, why are they worrying about, you know, this is a word with onyomi of this kanji. Now that I know that, like, I'm going to know this kanji better. Well, if that word is useful, you're going to learn it soon anyway. If it's not useful, you're going to learn it eventually. Right. If it's not useful at all, maybe you'll never learn it unless you have a very specific reason to learn it. Um, and I was going through a kanji app just this morning, just because I'm always checking out how other people are teaching things. And it had like a little level check thing in the beginning. And to check if you're advanced, it was, do you know the difference between these three kanji? And I didn't, I didn't know the difference between them because they're not in words. If you gave me the words that they appear in, I'm sure I could read them because I can read books in Japanese. Right. So we are presented with this problem where we don't want to waste a student's time, but they think that we're not teaching them if we don't push them toward a certain path that they think is a productive use of their time. Right. And this is happening now with kanji is a great example, but it's going, it's going to happen with anything we teach, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting problem to try to solve because on the one hand, you don't want to ignore what a student thinks is important because many times they will be right, at least partially right or fully right. Yep. And many times there's no such thing as right or wrong. It just depends. I don't think it's a waste of time to learn kanji. I think it's helpful because it gives you peace of mind. And because sometimes it's really cool to learn a word that contains two kanji that you already know and be like, oh, that kanji plus this kanji means that word. That's right. exciting. That's really exciting for me as a student to learn. So I think it's useful. I think if you're worried about it, that is not useful. Yes. So. I think, um, hmm. there's a lot in there. You said a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely there's this balance between what people are worried about. Understandably, we were there too. We were worried about it. But now on this side of things, you know, it's almost like we want to talk to our past selves and be like, Hey, you didn't actually need to waste all this time. And especially because, or by waste all this time, I mean like spend this time worrying or being concerned about you know, if it was going to work or what, what not. Um, and so we see that and we're caught in this space where we're, we have, a, you know, we're teaching new students and we want to help them, you know, avoid the mistakes that we made. Uh, but there's so much noise out there on the, inter on the internet. It's hard to, to know and to feel like, am I doing what, in what I, is what I'm doing going to work? Uh, so that we have to build the platform to account for that. And I think in the case of kanji, it doesn't do that right now. It currently does not account for it. it I, right now it works to teach you the content and to actually teach you the kanji, but it doesn't account for the, the students feeling of that. They're not going to learn them well enough. That's what it doesn't do right now. So yeah, I think because so. the, the, honestly, the, the answer to how do you learn to read Japanese? Right? That's what kanji is. How do you do it? It's don't worry about it, right? Like I'm the, I'm the biggest example of that approach because I, you know, I quit RTK after like 1500 completely. And then I just stopped any sort of kanji learning method entirely. hundred percent done. I just was like, I just, I don't, not interested. I can't do it. Well, I, no, I can't do it isn't the good word. I just didn't like doing it. It didn't feel useful and it was not motivating for me to learn kanji in that method or any, I didn't use any app. I did nothing. I just did 
my other studies for Japanese uh, while we were building, you know, Nihango Shark and the Native Shark. And that was just um, reading lessons and uh, learning sentences, immersion, this kind of thing. I did no specific kanji thing. But now I get emails from the bank and I can read the entire email. And I'm like, how did that happen? At what point did I become able to read a letter from the bank? Or I can read the newspaper now too for like... 85 percent something you know obviously there's some words that i look up or just skip over whatever but like i can i can read these things and how did that happen i don't really know other than i didn't worry about it. at a certain point i just stopped worrying about it uh and i just you know i used to be ridiculous with my flashcards i used to hit hard or forgot on everything and i would end up with like 1500 reviews and then i would quit for like months at a time because i didn't want to deal with that so then i'd reset the deck and i'd be like well i reset the deck so i have to start over so i would start over from the beginning and i would go through it again and then the same thing would happen. So at a certain point, I just realized this is madness. Uh, and I stopped. And I stopped using, using flashcards entirely for a really long time until I was finally able to build a system, which is the one that became what Native Shark is now, where it's uh, don't worry about it and res respond based off of how you feel about it. And honestly, clicking like the, the meh face or the smile face just over time is actually better than clicking forgot all the time. Because... When you click forgot all the time, it's because you're worried that you're not going to remember it. But the point of when SRS works is that it resurfaces it again in the future. So if you're constantly clicking forgot, which is what I used to do, it basically ruins it. It breaks your progress. You know, hit, thinking it's always pass fail just breaks the progress. It's not. I mean, that's a really that's a really strong statement, but I feel pretty confident to make that it is not that. The brains don't work that way, right? Um, so if you just kind of don't worry so much, and the thing is over my story that I just talked about of like f failing and the thing is I never stopped. That was the thing. I never actually quit. I always continued. I always came back and I always kept going in a direction. The direction looked like this sometimes, but it was a direction. And that's the biggest thing, right? It's like, so if you're clicking, you know, the meh face or the smile face, as long as you keep showing up, now if you stop showing up, now it's going to matter and you're probably going to forget. But if you don't stop showing up, so, okay, maybe in a month because you clicked smile too prematurely. So it got, and then the second time you saw it, you literally had no recollection. Of, okay, fine. Click forgot. That's fine. C click the cry face. It's okay. Um, but generally the way that it works is it's, and this is what's so hard about the product, like what we're doing and even learning in general, is it, it's not immediate results. You know, it's like, this is a result that will take place over months at a time, sometimes years. That's where you'll see these things add up. Like, through my Japanese learning um, journey, there were many times where I felt like, I, even today, I, I often feel like I'm complete trash, which is kind of true, <laughs> depending on the context. Um, but I'm way better now than I was uh, a couple of years ago, you know, and somehow I arrived here. So, you know, what we need to do as platform, you know, as, as educators and platform creators is, um, you know, the content is there. And we're always working on improving that. But we also have to think a lot about the psychological aspect of it because it's really how long can you maintain motivation? You know, how can we reassure students better? And right now, like I said, the kanji isn't doing that well enough. Despite the fact that the content for kanji is there, the reassuring aspect of it isn't there. And that's what we really need to work on. Um, and then just in general, the whole platform um, needs to have that, that emotion. Um, because it is, again, like we said in the earlier in our conversation, it's about the framework, you know, the way that you think about something basically determines its reality. Yeah. yeah. That was um, a lot of words. And I'm sorry, we, we did, it was, but good words. And I, I know we said we're going to save comments for later, but I just wanted to point out the one from Amnistar where he says that I know that I've understood a sentence without knowing how to pronounce things because I recognize the kanji meanings and can translate it ish. So I definitely struggle with the idea that learning kanji meanings isn't helpful. And I think that is correct and valid. But that doesn't mean you need to know an English word that represents the meaning of that kanji. Yeah. I want to say, too, I the same it's thing. not. I often, often see things. I, did, I wouldn't have been able to read, but I can decipher it because I know the kanji. And in 99.99% .99 of cases, I know the kanji because I know words that contain those kanji. I don't remember. I can read all. I can read everything on this milk tea bottle, and I can read this word that's bito, which means like light sugar, not very sweet. And you ask me what does like b mean in bito? I think it's the b in bimyo, 
So it's like not very much or something like that. It's not very much sugar, mm -hmm. right? Bimeo. Um, I can't write it from memory. If it was in a flashcard, I probably wouldn't know what to say is the, is the English meaning. But I know the words that, that it's used in. And so if I see a different word with, with that has this kanji in it, I can think, oh, that's the B and Bito, it's the B and Bimeo, it's the, you know, Which, and so on. side note, this is um, how like Japanese or na native speakers refer to kanji themselves. It's like Bimeo no B, you know? Yeah, yeah, they do that, yeah. Um, Soldan, no Some, sometimes they act, they do it other ways, yeah, but, but it's very common. But to ref you're referring to them that. within the context of words is the way that native speakers refer to them typically. Not, there's other ways, but um, you know. yeah, well, it's easier to refer to them that way, right? Um, so, yeah. A another um, point on what you were saying with like what Amistar said is, um, it's not that that isn't. Okay, that it doesn't work to, to learn kanji through English meetings, like like strictly like that. Um, which, I mean, like, that is how we are teaching our kanji right now, just as an aside. That is how it's being done. Um, but what we're saying is, like, you don't need to, like, spend all this time on it. That's what we're talking about right now. Um, but uh, it's not that it doesn't work. It's just that you don't have to do it. And it takes a lot of effort to do it that way, to worry about it, to, to spend so much time yeah. failing yourself on kanji when you don't have to. That's what we're getting at here. It's like, you can do that. We've done it, but you don't need to do it. So if you don't need to do it, and if that's causing you to slow up in your studies, then just don't do it and you'll still be fine. Yeah, this also goes back to the issue of the platform as we want it to be and what it is right now. Yeah. Like the platform should work so that you could hover over any kanji in any context on it and see what that kanji means, like what its oh, relative English representations yeah. probably are. So you should be able to do what MSR is describing here, where you see a word that you're not familiar with, and you should be able to hover over each kanji in it and be like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it means that, I almost forgot, but yeah, this kanji means that, this one means that, so it totally makes sense this word means that. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but that's fine. Right. Um, I think that's really useful, and it's really helpful yeah, for learning the word that way. But it doesn't mean that you need to be able to produce that English word for that kanji right, on, by memory. On your own. That's a whole other thing. Okay, so off the a little bit off the the topic of kanji. There's the topic of flashcards. This is another topic that I'm Your that I'm very very <laughs> passionate about. Um, I kind of hate flashcards. Just gonna throw that out there as a spicy statement. Um, but I will love and hate them actually, as I also love flashcards. Um, but I hate them when. I feel in the past compelled to use them incorrectly. Um, and then I, and I love them when they're used smoothly and when they feel like a, like a, just a nice, I don't know, nice experience on my brain. I like a little tickle on my brain. Oh, this was nice. That's, that's the, I don't know how to describe it other than like this emotions that I get from, from flashcards, but there's like evil, terrible flashcards that I hate. And there's really nice flashcards that I love. And, and what, distinguishes the two of them um i think is is I, I took a really long time to figure this out but what it is is using flashcards to learn a language or learn something learning through flashcards that's what i hate it, and it doesn't make sense for what a flashcard is it's intended purposes which is to be memory aid but if you're learning something new through a flashcard the first time you saw something was in a flashcard that's problematic just from the get-go and that's why they're so that's why i know i didn't like him and that's why so many students they struggle with it and it makes sense of course flashcards aren't we're like it's like the we accidentally forgot what flashcards are because they were handy and then we like mutilated them to be something else and that's what we've just been going on about for a long time and now we're like with native shark we're like wait a second why are we doing with this with with flashcards this doesn't make sense um so really happy yeah. flashcards are the ones where they're <laughs> yeah like ones that i love are ones they're the flashcards that are reminding me of something that I've already been exposed to. And another thing is like flashcards don't have to be these things that stick with you the rest of your life. They're ephemeral. They're just like, they exist for a little time in your life. They help you remind things for a certain time period and they go away. So they come in, they remind you of something you learned until it's kind of in your brain, you know, creates a new space in your, um, your own like neurons in your head. And then they kind of just chill and they go away. And then, but then there's the memory that kind of stays in your mind and it's like, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about here? 
yeah yeah i do it's been such um, a journey man to get to, to it has to, to, it to makes sense all this. that flashcards were and are used the way that we initially use them and that other people use them um it's because they're really useful but the way that they're most useful is too much of a hassle for anyone to do yeah so back in the day i had like 25,000 mature cards in Anki, yeah. something like that. It was like a ton of Japanese cards that I created every single one of them by hand. Um, I typed every single one of them. And I, and the reason I, ty- I typed them using example sentences that I found all over the place because I encountered them in the real world. I didn't realize at the time, but I, I wasn't learning from the flashcard. I was learning the word when I encountered it. And then I was putting it in a flashcard so I didn't forget it. Yep. But you can't just go tell a student, go interact with the language and magically encounter the concepts that would be most useful for you to learn. In the correct order, at the right time. And yeah, and handwrite the flashcards for all of them and get a native speaker to record audio that is accurate for them and all, all these other accurate things. Accurate to the context another, in which it was exposed. <laughs> yeah, another thing that is worth mentioning is that my flash, my 25,000 or whatever flashcard didn't have audio because I couldn't get audio for them. I was, how, was, how would I have done that by myself? Um, yep. So you get into this thing of like, well, Okay, well, here here are the words that a student should use. We'll just make the flashcards for them, yeah. which is good. But that doesn't mean that you should use the flashcards to teach them that you should give them a context in which a certain word or sentence would be natural to use and then have them encounter it. And then they can use flashcards to not forget it. Right. And if Native Shark works the way it's supposed to, which is what we're working toward, it's not there yet. Because the content builds upon itself, say there's a new word that you learned and the system knows that you're probably going to be in danger of forgetting it soon. So normally in SRS, um, a spaced repetition system, like a flashcard, smart flashcard algorithm, would then show you the word you're about to forget like the next day or something. Yeah. But if the, syst- if the platform is intelligent, it would know, well, you're going to see a sentence that contains that word tomorrow anyway. Yep. So why should we show you a flashcard that contains that word? Because you're going to encounter it anyway. Yep. Uh, so this is another issue of flashcards being really useful, but they're not always the most productive use of your time. And I think we've all, ex- any of us students who have used flashcards a long time, we know this feeling of that flashcard is really easy every time I encounter it. This one, I've forgotten it a hundred times and I keep forgetting it no matter what I do. Um. It's because there are limits to how well they work. Yes. It's not necessarily a problem with like you as a person or your ability to remember something. It's a problem. It's a failure of flashcards themselves in the way that they're being used. That's causing that to happen. Uh, Because you as a person are capable of learning Japanese and being highly proficient and reaching your goals. That's the facts. So it's a failure of the system. Yeah. Um, And then it's our own minds like, making us feel bad and thinking we need to do things. So we add all this extra weight to our learning, you know, progress that we or our learning path that we don't need. You know, we stress about also because I'm forgetting them, I must, I must also add in this and that. And then instead we just create a worse problem um, rather than just, you know, think about how to fix the way that we're using flashcards and also just not worrying about it and continuing to progress forward regardless. Yeah. You know so that so yeah all that to say but all that said like because i had flashcards i think i did have more success in the language because they did comfort me i would yeah i would study comes back you know that. i studied japanese for many years and then it doesn't matter what your level there are days when you think i'm not succeeding yeah <laughs> i i suck at this language and i forget everything and and I'll never i'm just never good. gonna get to the level that i want to be at yeah and but then you look at your flashcards and it says like well you've learned like it x thousand words it's like oh well 
I guess I don't. I haven't. I haven't completely failed. And yeah, I know more words than I did exactly. a month ago. So, I guess if I keep doing it, I'll know all the words I need to learn eventually. Yeah, I don't know when. Um, for that, flashcards really helped me because I was a professional at psyching myself out and quitting. Yeah, uh, I was always, you know, thinking it's not working. I gotta go study something else or study in a different way. I gotta, or just quit. Right. Um, well, that's and flashcards did help me think like you know just keep going and keep building up this number to a higher number and see what happens. That's the see that's the the, the beneficial psychological effects of of flashcards is that and so that's why with with native shark we have to like again flashcards that are good are great flashcards that are bad are horrible so so instead. You know, what, we, what we're doing, what we're working on is really building the right kind of flashcards, the happy flashcards, basically. The ones that give you those good, you'll go look at your, your archive, you know, be like, oh my God, I know so much Japanese. I guess I don't suck. And you'll scroll through and you'll be like, oh, I know that. Oh, I know this too. Okay. I feel, I feel okay. I can keep going. Um, you know, that's the, the beauty and the beneficial part of uh, building a, like a comprehensive platform for learning languages is that we can do that kind of stuff, right? We can take the time to figure out how to build the, you know, con like in some cases, content is the easy part. Like, right? what are you going to teach when and what's your methodology? Okay, put that together. But like the design and the the user experience and the emotive side of things, like that takes a lot more time to get right. Uh, and takes a lot more iteration, a lot more trial and error, pushing things out to users, getting feedback back from users. But eventually, eventually, yeah, it's going to be incredible. Um, and it'll feel absolutely spectacular to learn something through Native Shark, because because we're thinking about that yeah. a lot, not just the content. We're not just thinking, well, what do we need to teach you when? What is the raw facts that you need to get into your brain? And then we're thinking a lot about like, how do you stay? How do you actually succeed? How do you keep going? You know, so that the um, the emotional or the motivation, the mental side of things, is often more important than the actual content side of things. Yeah, I agree. Like Cinder just said, it's it's hard to accept how long it is going to take. Yeah. And then to that, I would say how long what is going to take because it's the same. It's like there's like a speech by Alan Watts where he talks <laughs> about life, how it's it's building up to this thing. Like the thing is coming. You go to you go to high school and you once you yeah. graduate high school, you know you'll you'll go to college and the thing is coming. It's a thing called like success or something. The thing is coming and then. Someday in your mid forties or early fifties, you think, "Oh, I've, I've arrived. Here it is. <laughs> it's the thing." Um, and it's this idea of you don't go to hear a musical or something, or you don't listen to a song to hear the climax. You don't just fast forward to the climax. Yeah, which is a bunch of crashing sounds into your ears. Um, you listen to the music along the way. Right. And I used to just be obsessed with when I was going to be fluent in Japanese and when I was going to be able to understand anything like a TV show completely and then you get to this issue of what is the where are you trying to go because you know I get to the point then where that TV show I liked back then well yeah I could watch it now and I understand 100% of what is being said yeah but then I go watch a medical drama or something and I probably am going to miss some things. And the really tricky thing there is you get to a certain level in the language where you're missing things that a native speaker also misses, but they know that it's, they're supposed to miss it and it's okay. Whereas you just think you don't know the language well enough. Right. If you watch an episode of like CSI or something, they're going to use words and talk about things that you don't know about like forensic science for example, but to a, f a foreign learner of the language, like a foreign speaker, they don't know that the native speaker sitting next to them didn't know the word that they just used. Right. I say this all the time because the Ray still does flashcards for English because we don't teach English on Native Shark yet. And she has some flashcards that are like, I don't know the words. I'm like, I don't know that word. Yeah. And she's like, I don't care if you know it. I read it in a book. And, like, <laughs> and so there's that whole thing. And I used to be really worried about where when I was going to get to this level that I, I didn't even know what the level was. Whereas now that I've, I don't know if I've just gotten older and calmed down a bit, but mm -hmm. 
it's just more fun. I, m I miss being a lower level student of Japanese. It was really fun. Um, and because of that, it's really exciting to me to think about learning new languages because there's so many exciting milestones earlier that are, that are really cool. Yeah. Like the first time you order some food, the first time you talk to a stranger, the first time someone asks you for directions in that language, right. like a native speaker. Native answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I'm walking to the station from my house and you know, a Japanese guy stops on his bike and asks me for asks asks me for directions somewhere in Japanese, and I'm like, I just gave a Japanese person directions in Japanese yeah, in Japan. Yeah, exactly. It's so weird, and you don't have to be really, really extremely good at the language to to have these experiences. And there are new experiences that get unlocked along the way as you get better, and I've right. I've ex I still experience new ones like new things that are getting unlocked based on knowledge i've obtained but the density at which they are unlocked early on is really exciting so i kind of miss it exactly so the question of how accepting how long it's going to take is for what you know it's, it's yeah. all right um there you know but yeah but then you have you can't <laughs> we can just get a new student in native shark and be like okay let's Let's watch this video by Alan Watts yeah, and talk yeah, about. Yeah, of course. You know? And even if it uh, was, to, it's to a not certain extent, hacking it. Japanese was like that. Yeah. That's what Native Nihongo Shark was like, um, and it was great for some people and not for others. Mm. And so we do have the problem there. We do have the problem of you let students choose their pace, and they all choose the fastest one. Well, I don't, I don't want to learn Japanese in four years. I want to learn, learn it in two, two, yeah. one, oh, a month. I want to learn in. I want to learn it now. I saw, uh, <laughs> I saw a music video posted yesterday somewhere that showed up in my recommended videos. It was like, how I learn any language in 24 hours. Yeah. And it's, well, that sounds better than four, four years. years. I want to learn in 24 hours. Yeah. So this is the situation that we're in where the student has an idea of where they want to go and they want to get there as fast as possible. Of course. So you can't just be like, oh, well, don't worry about it. Don't worry about where you want to go or how long yeah. it's going to take. Yeah. You're going to say, well, I'm going to go study what this guy told me. I'm going to learn it in a month. And then they're not going to succeed that way because most likely if they're getting a promise like that, it's an unethical promise, um, which means they're probably studying with the wrong resource. Hmm. I'm not saying we're the only resource. There are good resources all over the place for any subject you want to learn. The problem is usually you have to put a bunch of them together. Right. But so, yeah, we can't just like drop these philosophical yeah bombs these philosophical feel goods at the beginning of everything yeah yeah for sure we you know this is our podcast though so we can talk philosophical about the way the way, the way we think the yeah. way we feel about things um you know but yeah that's again it just comes back to the design you know you have to we have to design it in a way that um these things are being like subconsciously realized by the student and that's a challenge you yeah know? um but uh you know we've made strides towards that you know it's like we've made progress towards that from where we've come from to where we are <laughs> now um little by little, little by like we're gonna get to where we want it to be eventually but even what it is now is it's pretty good and in, in, in that regard um you know but yeah there are things that are still Need, need improvement in that in in that way um so yeah that's our kanji discussion and our flashcard discussion and now i think we can um take a scroll through some of these questions and answer some of them yeah. and then you guys could keep asking us more questions and then we'll just do this for a bit and then we'll we'll finish up um so i'm gonna scroll back a bit up here and see what kinds of things we maybe missed I'm going to run to the restroom and be back in three minutes. All right. But you can start, you can start answering questions. Just Maybe I'll it. just talk to chat. Yeah, that works. <laughs> All right. See you in a bit. Why not include some philosophy slash learn how to learn? You don't think it'd be well received? Has it not been well received previously? Um, it's not that it um, isn't well received. 
or wouldn't be it's that it isn't well received by a ton of people right it'll it'll resonate with a few people but a lot of people a lot more people will will not have the interest so it it's not that you can't include philosophy it's that you can't that can't be your main thing right if the goal is to get the most amount of people to actually complete their goals that's a you know that's a a consideration that has to be made in how you you present things so it's not that we won't or don't include philosophy um and slash how to learn it's that figuring out where to include it and how to include it is the challenge if that makes sense um sup caleb how you doing uh, i'm pretty good i'm a little bit um hot in this room actually but that's probably because we have little doors closed to prevent extra echoes <laughs> but yeah, how are you doing? How's it going in Texas, I think, is where you are? Hmm, what else do we have in here? How is Beat Saber? All right, this this comes from um, a, a stream, that, on Chie's stream, I think it was, where uh, she was painting and I was playing Beat Saber in the background. Um, and Beat Saber is great. I love Beat Saber. It's tons of fun. Um, the other day I was playing on like Expert Plus or something like that. And I hit my Fitbit said that I hit um, cardio heart rate for 15 minutes straight at uh, 140, I think, or 135 BPM. Tons of fun. I didn't realize how much um, effort it can be. <laughs> it's, a, it's a workout. It's a real workout. It's tons of fun. I love it. Especially on the, the Expert. Now, now, like playing hard mode, it feels like slow. I'm like, oh, I can't play this. It's too easy. So, um, what's it like living in Fukuoka? I love it. It's my favorite place in Japan, and the weather right now is fantastic. And it's November fourth. I absolutely love living in Fukuoka. So, yep, I've lived in Tokyo, uh, and Fukuoka, and sometimes I still live in Tokyo for a while to meet up with Nico and stuff. But Fukuoka, ten out of ten, do recommend. Is my favorite. Why doesn't Nico have a DXR racing gaming chair? Um, because he's not a gamer. He's not a real gamer. He hasn't gamed for years. He he's a wannabe gamer. Yeah. <laughs> this non DXR yeah. racer chair. If you see this behind me, this is real real gamer <laughs> status over here. <laughs> yeah, my desk is a dining room table, actually. Yeah, this is a dining room table too, actually. That became where I play games, but I also have a real desk that my computer for work is set up on. The other reason is that I don't need all that neck support because when I'm working, I'm usually slouched like this. <laughs> See, that's, um, can you, can you No, yeah, this? I didn't need a, a reclining office chair. I used to have one. Yeah. Um, Mansoul says, I'm, I'm upgrading from great. milk tea to, Tansan Sui. I also have Tansan Sui, but oh, yeah. non-sponsored, so it, no label. Is it Psycho? Oh, no, <laughs> I'm just I'm like... kidding. Um, but yes, yeah, same one. It's the same one. Same one. Copycat. Well, it's because I did what you told me to do. I bought them from Amazon. I'm not copycat. Boy, I'm following your advice. You're making All me right. want to go to Fukuoka. You should. I don't know why you haven't already. Wait, where are these... Okay, that's bottom. definitely great posture, Nico. Yeah, maybe not. Um, that's why you don't get back, don't don't any back pain. <laughs> I've never gotten back pain from the way I sit. Interesting. Yeah, me either. Although I occasionally get neck pain from my slouching, so that's why I try to sit like a proper. I don't know. It's a struggle. Um. All right. Well, now that Nico's back, we can. Maybe answer some of these. I only spent two days in Fukuoka and I was almost too tired to do much while I was there. Well, that's depressing. Come back. <laughs> Text me. I've never been there, so. We'll, um, <laughs> we'll go get, like, I don't know, get a beer or something, unless you don't drink beer, in which case we can go get coffee. It's all good. What if it doesn't drink caffeine? Because they won't. If it doesn't drink caffeine, then we can go get boba. Go buy some. If he doesn't drink sugar. Go buy some free and go for a then, walk. Okay. Boba has caffeine in it. What? Oh, the tea. Well, you could get like, I give up. The juicy one. He says he drinks both yeah. those things. So this is irrelevant. Okay, awesome. Um, because they don't let me in the country yet. 
ha ha. Yeah, that's a struggle. You know, someday, someday the world will open yeah. up. I mean, Emmy Star is scaring oh, yeah. me. He says I'm gonna ruin my back. I should get a gaming chair, apparently. You know, maybe. I'm sure there's better chairs. Um, yeah, it would be nice if people could come to Japan sooner than later, as my mom tells me every day because she wants to come see her grandson also, and she can't. Also, my parents want to visit. Is Nico not in Fukuoka? Do you not have a big fancy office there? We do have an office here. I don't know about big and fancy, but we do have one. And the reason why Nico is not here is a complicated answer, to which the the <laughs> yeah, answer I can, I can the answer is want. someday. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's whatever. Small and fancy, sure. The main reason is that Ray's mom lives down the street and she watches the baby for us like every day. Actually, and Nico, the main reason is I've come I've come to rely on it very greatly. No, no, no. That okay, that's semantics. The main reason is we don't have enough subs on Native Shark yet. So subscribe. That's yeah. Well, that too. Subscribe so Nico can come live in Fukuoka. That's the that's the underlying reason. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Let's go see some of these more in, um, in-depth questions. Um, let's see. <laughs> yeah, you just pick them out. Once so the content production goes them. wide slash scales horizontally, any thoughts on ways to make sure the content still has that Nico feel? I think that keeping that tone yeah, may be important for many that. of us, especially those <laughs> from the Nihongo Shark days. Um. The fact that it's from the Nihongo Shark to Ace doesn't really matter to us, but the but the feeling of uh, I'm a learning with an actual person who's been through what I'm going through is super important for us, and we think about it all the time. So, have thoughts been put into that? Yes, every single day. It's, it's, it's yeah, I'm important. obsessed with that. Um, and it also touches back on this. I very, very briefly mentioned earlier that I enjoyed the book Lynchpin by Seth Godin. And part of the reason is that the people who will write lessons should be lynchpins, which is that they should not be cogs in a content creation machine. Um, to a certain extent, you could have people that do not have the native truck philosophy or manner of teaching under their belt, creating sentences and materials because they've, in, they've encountered the language in the real world and they can tell you a context in which a certain thing is useful to learn. But we need people who are on the same page as educators and learners mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. convey that information yeah. to students. And we have been coming up with some standards that we would hope to use with writers of content as they join our team. I think those standards are pretty good now, but I think they're gonna change a lot because the fact remains that we don't have other writers of content that work full time for us at the moment um, because we need more subs as Caleb mentioned. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's something that we think about a lot, so much actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm very concerned about it because I think losing that would be a great significant loss and it would in some ways make us lose a bit of the soul of the company. It would be a travesty basically. Yeah. But that's why like we just had this whole discussion on the user experience, the emotive part of learning and that it, that is directly tied into that 100%. They're the same. Like yeah. the way that the platform is designed and then also the way that the content is written, it's it's for that um you know, that part of things. Um, what kind of headset do I have? Who, Nico or me? Um, people seem to like the less than interstitials. Yes, they do. And we should make sure there's enough yeah. of those. Yeah, we call them lesson cards internally. Yeah. Um, and we have lots of plans for those but yeah i love them too and they're gonna evolve mm. let's see there was another 
interesting question up here. Where was that one? People talking about uh, comments in our flashcard discussion. Um, yeah, I think my relationship, Cinder says, yeah, I think my relationship with flashcards has greatly Im improved after the emojis showed up. That's great to hear. Um, I am the C. Let's see. I went through RTK up to 1200 or something, but it wasn't until I switched to using Native Shark that I found myself reading kanji and sometimes even reading without thinking about it. Exactly. That's what we're saying. Cool. It does. It does. It does work. Um, you're probably learning different things at a different rate to classroom teaching. Maybe the classroom will get you to master listening to people quicker, and Native Shark will get you to master vocab and grammar quicker. For example, question mark. Um, I don't. I disagree. Think so. I think you're going to be really bad at listening if you study at a, at a classroom. At a university classroom. I don't think you'd be very bad like, actually. They, yeah, very bad. Depends on what your definition of bad is, but yeah. My definition of um, bad is bad. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, you, you, yeah, it depends also, like, what is what is your goal? Yeah, like, for sure. University classes probably will get you good enough at listening to pass, say, JLPT tests because... Or to pass the class. They speak pretty slowly in those. Yeah. Even, if, even when they don't speak slowly, like in the N1 or something, they have these unnatural pauses, at, like, within sentences to make it easier for a student to hear. Mm. And it's, I don't want to say it's unnatural because there are certain contexts in which the language is used that way. Right. But then you go out in the real world and people are talking much differently and faster. And it feels like you don't know any Japanese because you're not used to hearing it. And I'm sure you guys should ask Ty about this next time he streams something because he's hmm. a great example of someone who was very good at Japanese and then realized he needed to improve his listening a lot right. after that. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let him talk about his story whenever you guys get a chance to join his stream. For sure. But yeah, no, Native Shark should actually get you better at listening a lot faster than, than normal because of um, the fact that we don't slow down our audio. We just give you native audio from the first day, like the way that people actually speak. And we intentionally look for audio files that sound sometimes almost um, like there's something else. So that you get used to the fact that it, there's a lot of variation in the way that things can sound. Um, yeah, a lot of times Chie refers to it as lazy pronunciation, which I like. Yeah, um, because which is common. That's it's really common. Like, but, listen to me speak English. I I feel like I don't even sound good at all. But that's just I'm just a native speaker, and that's how I speak. Uh, I I could like put on a voice, and I could talk very um, specific and very intentional. But that would be a put on voice. That wouldn't be me just having a conversation with Nico kind of voice, which is the one that I use like 95% of my day. And the one that you're going to hear me if you run into me. So that's why we teach that audio, the audio that you hear most of the time when you're talking to people. And because if you can understand that, you can also understand clear speech. Whereas if you only study slow, clear speech, you can't understand fast, rapid speech. So that's why it's done in that order. Um, so yeah, I think you with, um, you'd do much better with native shark than classroom for listening. Um, but, and then we also do focus um, in on vocab and, and grammar, of course, but yeah, we do. Yeah. We try to do everything. That said, uh -huh. the, the platform currently, um, doesn't use shadow loops to the fullest extent, which we're working on, on getting there because those are some of the things that can help you a lot with your listening comprehension, um, and your speaking ability and your pronunciation. Um, and right now you have to be a pretty motivated student. You have to like build a, a um, we just got the update out that now it only shows you stuff from the lessons you've learned, which is great. So it's not just this massive list, but you still have to be pretty motivated to go do that. And you have to go build custom albums and stuff like that. Um, we're, we're working on getting some really nice pre-generated ones um, that are relevant and contextually relevant to your current studies and how you did with your flashcards, et cetera. Um, so that'll be nice. Yeah, the ult the ultimate power up of Shadow Loops will be when we have native mobile apps released, obviously. But yeah, those we have a lot of cool stuff planned before then too. This last question that just came up, I want to answer. Well, there's before you before you specifically answer it. Oh, come no, on. I got you. There's another person who asked kind of the <laughs> same question, and, and I want them to both be addressed. Uh, okay. It's the same question though. Um, let me find it. Well, pick one, and I will await your reading of that question. Yeah, it was by Rainy Wisp, and I'm trying 
to find it because <clears throat> they both worded it slightly differently, which is why I wanted to. Here we go. Um, yeah. All right. So from Rennie Wisp, we have, it looks like your interconnected system of multiple languages will be harder and slower to maintain as the number increases. Do you have anything planned to combat that? And then we have from I am the sea just now. I was a little nervous reading your last update regarding expanding Native Shark to learn other subjects and other languages. While I'm excited to someday learn Korean through Native Shark, what I'm worried about is the other work interfering with the rollout of phases two, three, and four for Japanese. Can you help alleviate my worry? He he, smile face. Yeah, so um, don't worry about it because actually it's not going to slow us down. Yeah. Um, and I'll talk about why. Uh, the way we used to think about adding new languages to Native Shark was like we have English to Japanese, and then down here we get Japanese to English, and we have Spanish to Japanese up here. Um, instead, the way it's going to work is we have a target language, like Japanese, for example, and then we have English, Spanish, you know, Korean, for example, I put it that way. Mm. So it's like you have the target language and then the source languages, and the source languages are built on top of the target language. So because of that, we could add other directions without slowing down any other direction, as long as the target language is being created at a certain pace. Hmm. So we can have the target language content made for Japanese, which is why earlier I mentioned just kind of offhandedly that I used to plan the units for Native Shark, and I decided, you know, what we should teach next. And obviously, I consulted with Ray and other Japanese speakers the whole time, nonstop, every day. Hmm. Um, we've actually flipped it. So now it's Ray is planning what we're going to teach in Japanese and consulting with me and other non native speakers of Japanese. And also, she consults with native speakers and materials also. Be the reason we're doing that is because we want the path to be determined by the target language, but keep in mind various source languages. We refer to source language as the language in which like a lesson is written. So for people here, the source language is English, the target language is Japanese. You don't want to go too, f you don't, you have to be really careful to, when you do this because it's what all the other educators start with when they teach Japanese, for example. And I think we can all agree that there are a lot of problems with the way Japanese is taught by most educators. Um, I'm not going to get too far into that, but I can say that it the way that we've done this, it's actually faster. It'll be faster for us to teach Japanese from English with the system we've set up to have more languages. Hmm. And we're not going to you know, make less content for learning Japanese so that we can have content for learning Korean. We're not going to make less content for learning Japanese so that we can teach English from Japanese. What we're going to do is we have the target language like Japanese, and then we have source languages like English, Korean, Spanish. And since Japanese is our first target language, it will continue to grow faster than any of the others. And adding a source language does not affect the rate at which the target language is being produced. And we already have the team for making the English source language. so. That will be the fastest one. And then adding other ones, it doesn't slow us down because it doesn't take anyone away from the job they're already doing. If that makes sense. Yep. Essentially, it's um, parallel, not series. So. Yeah. Um, also, we're not going to go hire a content architect for like Jap or Korean or something. Content architect is the person who plans a phase. Is, or leads the planning of a phase, I should say. Um, we're not going to go hire a content architect for Korean or Spanish or English unless we have the Japanese content coming out faster than any student could hope to learn it already. Right. You got to prove it with one, make sure everything works, the system's functional, processes are effective, then you scale. Um, so the point at which uh, students can no longer keep up with uh, the rate at which Japanese content, English to Japanese content is being created, is the point at which we begin the 
parallel scaling essentially and then it doesn't matter um, because it's you know this kind of thing <laughs> yeah and adding a source language like teaching Japanese from Spanish is really low influence on our um, ability because the target language is way ahead yep. like we're already pretty far in what we need to teach for Japanese so teaching it from Spanish or something is just setting up the workflows so that we have the right translations and meanings written down and then we have the right people teaching that in Spanish right it's, it's um, about the systems more so, than anything yeah. else um so yeah I don't know don't be worried uh, uh you said can I alleviate your worry worry alleviated <laughs> there you go i hope i hope it did um all right let's see why isn't why is university language classes so slow question from last stream why indeed i mean i don't want to like <laughs> i don't want to go too hard on universities I'll, I'll start by saying the really great thing about a university class yeah. is that you have to pass it. Otherwise, there are extreme consequences. Yeah. Because you've probably spent a ton of money on it and you probably Multiples need the degree that's attached to it. Yep. Um, so you're invested in completing it. And I think because of that, they are successful to a certain extent because you're more likely to complete it. Yep. What's at stake when you go download a language learning app? You know, nothing. Yep. Unless, I mean, if you pay money for it, a little bit more is at stake. But if you drop out of the class, you don't have to go and call your parents and be like, "Hey, uh, yeah, those student, <laughs> I those student out. loans, <laughs> woof." I, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's one of the benefits. So I think, yeah, they're motivating university classes. Why they're slow? I mean, they're based around books. Um, they have to go at the speed the whole class can go at. Yep uh what's a university like if it's a 15 credit class for a semester then you're doing maybe what 15 hours per week yep or something like that something like that it's like it's actually actually pretty good if it's focused but it's probably not, not focused typically um if, if you go to have speaking practice in a classroom setting you're probably not speaking to a native speaker yep um if you do get to speak to one which would be the teacher maybe it's like 30 seconds to a minute in the whole 40 minutes to an hour class when you are speaking, you're speaking to a fellow student who is also using incorrect language. The teacher might come by and correct you, but he's also got to do that for all the other language pair. I mean, all the other student pairs in the class. So mm -hmm. it's hard to get feedback. It's hard to practice what you want to say. It's hard to learn the content that you want to learn for your personal goal. Uh, the audio is slowed down because it's based around a textbook. The textbook is based on the way that the language is taught and the tests that are used. I mean, the whole course has to be built around tests, which is a whole other problem with language learning. Um, because to have a test, you have to start telling people what is right and wrong about individual things. Even if those are, those are things that you'll figure out naturally by getting exposure to the language. Um, this is part of the reason I get really annoyed using most education apps, of it, learn, learning apps for anything not just languages is that they're obsessed with testing you on things even if it doesn't matter if you should know the thing or not mm. because because the whole idea is that the machine needs, needs to be able to tell you if you're making progress or not and the only way it knows how to do that is to test you because it's too it's too you know nebulous to just say mm. let the student decide which is a whole other problem you have to deal with because students often don't know how good they are at something me included, everyone. Um, well, so, yeah, you it's, can't it's know because you're well, inexperienced. Like, like, you're learning yeah. to learn the information. So when you start, you just you don't know. It's impossible to know. Yeah. And you probably don't know if the thing they're testing you on is important or right. not. You, well, you can't know because you're, you're new at the topic. So you have to trust that it is. Yeah. Essentially. So testing, yeah, is a whole yeah. thing. Um, so those are some of the reasons why university language classes are so slow. Um, they are effective in some ways, um, but we think that it can be done a lot better. Of course we think that because we built Native Shark, which you should, should subscribe <laughs> to if you're not. <laughs> so we can keep building.
cool stuff. Um, let's see. Any more questions? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Um, I think we got through most of the questions. Um, if those still um, watching have more questions of any sort, can be related to language or business or living in Japan or whatever, feel free to ask them. Uh, I think we'll hang out for a couple more minutes and then um, we'll, we'll wrap up. But yeah, feel free to shoot us a couple more questions. Um, in the meantime, my question for Nico is yes. how is it so quiet what? in your house? Uh, the baby's asleep. <sighs> okay. That makes sense. Yeah, but because but because of that, the door is closed, and this room is gradually heating up because the sun is attacking this window right here. Yeah, next to me. I have that same thing so, happening, but not because of a baby. I'm I'm looking forward to opening the door and being silent, <laughs> so the baby doesn't wake up and I get to be cool. Yeah, sharks don't do well no. in forty degree rooms. That's facts. No, they don't. Uh, I agree. Not not about that. So we've said that we want sort of the stream to become a podcast of some kind. And for those that don't know, I'm obsessed with podcasts <laughs> because I'm obsessed with learning things. And especially when I'm not able to look at stuff, like when I'm going to the gym or walking or whatever. And I've been thinking a lot about other types of podcasts Native Shark could do. Um, if we if we think of Native Shark as sort of a, a media company, which in some respects it will be, and it is somewhat becoming, it's, a media company has different shows. So if we had different podcast shows, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about what they would be. And it's fun, but also challenging, because I, I think most of the most of us language learners have tried language learning podcasts or YouTube videos. And they're really exciting to download. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Because you feel like, whoa, I'm downloading 300 episodes of this podcast. I'm going to learn so much. And I, I, for one, have a really hard time paying attention to a, like a language learning podcast, for example. Yeah. Um, so dealing with that kind of thing, if we did have a podcast is something I've been thinking a lot about what is what would those look like and I have some ideas but I'm not gonna yeah, talk too much about them. this is why like in the, when we have these discussions I'm I'm almost always on the side of like we just don't have a podcast that's related to language learning because it just seems like not a good idea but I still think Nico could probably come up with something that is a good idea, but it hasn't happened yet, so we don't have it. I think I think we are going to have them, and they are going to be useful. But what I think we should have I, is just I'm not sure what they'll be like. We yet. should just have it, they will never be a, a primary resource for learning the language. Of course, I'll say that. We, we should yeah. always. I mean, that's Native Shark, right? That's the primary resource. Yeah. <laughs> what we should have, I think. It's just different content creators that do what we're doing, but in the, the in the target language. They're just native speakers. They're just chatting. They're playing games, whatever. That's what I want. Like that's good content, I think. So it's like it's supplementary yeah, I want to what you're learning through Native Shark, because it's like, well, here's a resource where people are talking about, you know, just living their life, doing whatever. Maybe they're playing a game. Maybe they're cooking food. Yeah. Maybe they're having a podcast. You can listen to it as a learner. The the issue with that is if it's a podcast and it's in the target language and you're not at a very high level, you're probably not going to know what's going on unless they're talking about learning your native language in that target language, but then it's a language podcast still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot and I kind of, the idea I was playing with today is I don't know if anyone has ever heard the podcast 99% invisible. But for example, they have an episode on taking a walk, which was mm. recently published, and they feature different people talking about taking walks in their life. They have the host 
delivery person in Detroit. Yeah. And they have the blind girl with her seeing eye dog. And they have a mom with a two-year-old strapped to her back going for a hike in the forest. And they're talking about their experience of walking and how it relates to their life. And hmm. it's interesting, even though it doesn't sound like something that matters. It's just taking a walk. So I'm, I'm wondering if there is some version of that hmm. that involves the way that language is affecting a person's life, be it their native language or a foreign language. And if there is some creative way to put those together so that it is valuable to a person trying to learn a certain language. And I think it's possible. Uh, yeah, I agree. Like we briefly talked about that idea. And I think that one is the most promising for quality language learning podcast. For sure. I also have an idea for a solo one, but I'm going to keep that a secret <laughs> until I see if it works. Yeah, it should be cool. But um <laughs> since i've been working from home this year i listen to podcasts all day i've really wanted a good podcast to supplement my japanese studies so for the first thing is yeah the, the biggest like nick was saying the biggest struggle with trying to find a podcast to listen to to supplement your japanese studies is it really depends upon how far in your japanese studies you are on whether or not that's a going to be just a thing that's background noise or a thing that you're actually somewhat learning from um so that's it's a struggle um my approach to it, my personal approach is I kind of wait until I'm at a certain level in the target language that I got through my primary learning resource before I start spending a lot of time um, starting to immerse in different materials, uh, which leads down to Ursula's question, which is even though Native Shark is meant to be a sort of one stop shop, are there any other sources, sites, apps you'd recommend for extra credit? Um, I would recommend actual native material that's like all i would do like play video games in japanese if you enjoy those um read books if you enjoy those we are working on like native material guides that are going to be sort of set up via wh where your level is in native shark in your target language we'll have a suggested set of different media that you could get some value from and then there'll be a bit of like here's what language you do know that's in this resource and here's the stuff that's a bit too difficult but we're going to include it in this guide uh, because it'll help you and you'll be able to like add it to your custom flashcards um, and then once we get the dictionary in easy so that's the best way to use supplementary materials in native shark is um, finding as level appropriate as possible native resources um, that are enjoyable to you always do something that's enjoyable to you because any app, site, source, whatever that is not enjoyable to you, you should not do because it will ultimately make you quit, basically, or make you stop or make you stall. If it's not enjoyable to you as a, as a supplementary thing, don't do it. Like Because someone said it was good on the internet, don't do it. Um, yeah, don't, don't spend time doing things just for the sake of doing them. Yeah, I see people commenting about wanting good podcasts for learning Japanese. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm obsessed with podcasts. I love podcasts. And this is something that I struggle with is every time I want to learn a new language, I want to download a bunch of podcasts for it. And then I just, I, I always get kind of bummed out because I, I end up not really loving any of them. Um, I saw someone mentioned learn Japanese pod. That's I think Alex's podcast. Yeah. I like Alex. We're friends actually. Um, and I met with him for the first time, I think in 2016, 2015. And we went out for drinks in Shibuya. And he was telling me how he wanted to sort of change his podcast and make it more, I don't know, official, more of like an educational resource. And he seemed to be struggling with that. And I remember telling him why. I listen to your podcast. But that's because when I was a student, because he had a podcast mm -hmm. back when I was terrible at Japanese, like way back in 2012, even, I think I was listening to it. Yeah, sounds about right. 2011, actually. Um, and I told him, I used to listen to your podcast because I didn't really feel like studying, but I just wanted something about Japanese. Yeah, that's um, a good point. So I listened to it. And I think on that note, it goes back to what Caleb said of, listening to something that's enjoyable to you, but I think anything, it can also be in your native language, but about the thing, about the language. Right. I mean, about the thing that makes you want to learn the language. 
for example, if you want to learn Japanese because you want to play video games in Japanese, listen to a podcast where they talk about Japanese video games. And it's fine if they're just speaking English because when you listen to it, it's good, it's going to make you want to get better at Japanese and you're going to go want to study.、Um, this is actually Shadow Lips does this for me personally because I'll listen to you know, Shadow Lips of Korean or something. And then what I end up doing is just daydreaming about someday when I get good at Korean,、mm-hmm. all the cool conversations I'm going to have. So I, I like, can't wait to get home and go study some Korean by the end of it. Right.、Um, so I think that is helpful.、Um, if you want actual podcasts in Japanese, I like listening to. I used to listen to Pete, Pete no Fushigi n a g a r e j i So、mm-hmm. it's Pete's Mysterious, Mysterious Garage, garage、yeah. um, which used to be just interviews of people. And then they added some like, history stuff that was kind of boring, I thought. But.、Um, But that's like pre- pretty high level stuff. So I don't know if it'll be enjoyable depending on your level, maybe.、Um, There's this one I used to listen to where they used to talk about there was this the guy and this girl, and it'll just be they pick a random topic for that week and they would just talk about it for two hours in Japanese. Like potato chips. Oh, yeah. Was one of them. So there、I、was a dearth of podcasts available in Japanese until recently. They're starting to become more popular. So, that it used to be if you wanted to download a podcast in Japanese, it was just going to be trash quality. Like the audio was going to probably ruin your ears and it was not going to be interesting or anything, but they're getting better very quickly. When I listen to, I forget what it's called, so I'm looking it up on my phone.、Hmm. What I listened to just the other day was,、uh, oh yeah, this one is UK versus US Fancy in English Battle. <laughs> <laughs> and that one is, it's about learning English, but they're speaking Japanese. And both of the hosts are half Japanese, half,、oh, yeah. one of them is half American, and one of them is half British, I think.、Um, that was, that's an interesting podcast. I like it. But they're speaking all Japanese, so it might be kind of difficult. Yeah. I've actually learned a little bit about British English listening to it.、Um, and I, I like that one. It was only、like、12 episodes. But they're publishing new ones.、Um, Cinder asked if it was a Hikibiki podcast, which I actually think that's. What, what podcast? The one I was talking about.、Oh. I, that sounds familiar. Something like that. that.、Um, something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I think so. Some, it sounds familiar.、Um, but yeah, it was. It was good.、Um, I don't know. I always had this thing where I, when I was earlier in my studies, I would always try to listen to something like that, like a podcast full in Japanese. And it just it didn't actually motivate me. It kind of made me instead just kind of tired. I was like, well,、yeah, I don't, I don't know what this is. This is too much Japanese. And then I was just like,、eh. so I, get, I just didn't want to listen to it anymore. And it kind of slowed me down ultimately. So that's why I like, waited until it. I could actually understand the majority of it without effort. Then it was fun. And then I liked listening to podcasts、yeah. in Japanese. But for me, I, really... I did not like it just being noise. It was annoying, honestly, more than anything else. I really wanted to find a good podcast in Japanese about learning Korean. And I downloaded basically every single one that can be downloaded. And what I found was that they're the Korean and all of them is just. That because it's like a base Korean that they're speaking. I mean, they know some Japanese, but、right. they're speaking Korean mostly, and I'm not good enough. And so I just didn't know what's going on the whole time. Yeah, it's like, <laughs>、so、well, what just, am I doing? You know, I,、yeah. into them at all. I think it's important that it's actually intelligible,、um, which is why we teach、yeah. things in a、um, iterative,、um, contextual iterative manner. Yeah, this is not about podcasts, but one other thing you can do is if you have some shows that you really like in Japanese, you could、um, rip the audio from the show and listen to it as if it were a podcast. And because you know what happened in the episode, because you've seen the show, you know what's going on, even if the language is too high for you, too high level. So that's another way you can sort of have productive use of this low quality time. Um, but the problem there is it's 
kind of a hassle. It's also not an official recommendation. It's not, because I don't know how legal that is, unless you've actually bought the product and they probably don't even sell it in a digital format where you could do that. So I cannot officially recommend doing that. <laughs> yeah. Neither have I ever done that ever in my life. No, you definitely have not. Not even once. Um, Ty says, if you want to play video games in Japanese, come join my stream on this channel where I do just that. That's facts. Um, and we're working on getting some of these um, streams onto YouTube so that if you miss the stream, you can still have something that's about learning, speaking Japanese and playing games. Um, Ty goes through a lot of stuff. He, he um, When he hits words he doesn't know, he adds them to his custom flashcards and Native Shark and shows his process. Um, because if anyone in Native Shark is still good at doing flashcards, <laughs> it's probably Ty. <laughs> he does like his... Ray's really good at doing That's them. true. That's true, especially with the... Um, how much she reads. Yeah, she's cheating. I know. <laughs> she has cheats. Hacks. Hacks. All right. I think we've had a good a good go. We've gone for two hours and yeah, seven good. minutes. Um, I want to say that my energy is depleted. Um, but it was... Really? I feel pretty good. <laughs> well, I was up late. I don't know, man. I was up early. It's like midday for, it's past midday for me now yeah i got i was up late and i got up early so that's the double whammy yeah i've been awake for like seven hours it's 11 in the morning yeah look at you go thanks for sticking with us for two hours thanks for sticking with us for two hours it was fun yeah um we, kochira koso. Kochira koso. <laughs> we'll um we'll do this next week uh at the same time i think most likely. Tune in next week. Tune in next week. All right. You got to lower the decibels. Uh, I don't. Not the decibels. The, 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 the pitch. <laughs> the, the pitch. The, the, tone. Uh... the pitch. Hello. <laughs> I don't know. Tune in next week to Native Shark Startup. There, see? You got to say it. I can't say it. My voice isn't doesn't have that kind of t t tomber, timber, whatever. Tomber. What are these words? Timbra. Tim it's it's know. like T I M B R E. How do you say it? Yeah. Tim Tim it's timber. timber. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. That your voice has it and mine doesn't. That's what I know. Oh. If you say so. Yeah. I think so. Maybe not. <laughs> All right. Um Yeah. Ty Thank you everyone for coming. Ty, are you streaming after this or I don't know. I don't know what's happening next. I don't know if I'm just ending this. I didn't pre prepare. I didn't plan. Nati needs Native Shark to teach English, apparently. Yo, we are going to teach English, actually. Not after this. No, we'll stream tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, you can come join Ty tomorrow. Teach English from English. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nico. Great conversation. Um, yeah, thank you. Bye.